Hello, and welcome to the 10th episode of Honest Discussions. I'm your host, Dr. Brandon Patterson, and today we're going to be talking to a very talented postdoctoral researcher from the University of Cambridge Department of Genetics, Dr. Alexis Sperling. Her work revolves around, uh, well, do you remember the movie Jurassic Park and how all of the lizards were, or the dinosaurs were female, but then they started breeding? That's a process called parthenogenesis. And Alexis's work uh, really revolves around trying to solve the molecular uh, players in this process in the fruit fly. We uh, have a really great discussion. We learn that uh, the genes that are responsible for parthenogenesis in the fruit fly are also uh, cancer genes in humans. We talk about what it's like to be a fruit fly researcher. Uh, we discuss how hard it is to do these types of genetic studies, even when you have such a great model system like fruit flies. And we discuss rot why fruit flies and uh, C. elegans worms are really great model systems for studying complicated uh complicated biological processes that can be related to what goes on in humans. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. And if you could please like, share, subscribe. Uh, this is how we grow the channel. The more subscribers we have, the broader the reach is. And if we get to that 1,000 subscriber mark, we can be monetized, which will really enable me to take uh, what we're doing on this channel to the next level. So please, if you could just uh, throw a couple of clicks in there, would really appreciate it. And on that note, on with the show. What is a day in the life of a fruit fly scientist like these days? Oh, I don't know if I can speak about general life. Um as a fruit fly scientist, my life was completely chaotic um, because I had to collect virgins all the time. That's basically most of what I was doing was collecting virgins. So that means the flies can't have mated and that's how I control parthenogenesis. So I had to get up pretty early and go straight into the lab and collect virgins, sometimes up to four hours um, and then Often I would leave, I would go and have lunch and do something. And then I would come back in the afternoon, collect virgins again, um, because they could only be at 25 degrees Celsius for eight hours and, and then they're not virgin anymore, or they might not be. Um, and because you, you can't take that risk, then what you have to do is make sure that you're always within an eight hour window um, when the flies are at 25 degrees. Um, and you want them at 25 degrees because they develop faster. So then, and then I would often do some lab work. And then in the evening, I would um, collect virgins again. Um, and it just, it, luckily the other two virgin collections don't take as long as the morning one. The morning one is always the longest because um, that's when most of the females come out. And then um, at night, you put them at 18 degrees. Um, and, and this is important because they can, you can prevent collection for, you can leave them for up to 16 hours. And so that's kind of, that's your overnight being away time, but it's a maximum of 16 hours. And most fly geneticists will call it 15 hours, actually, just in case there's any sort of movement in the temperature. So then you have that 15 hours away, but that's, yeah, basically that's the maximum amount of time. So you, you end up spending less time away from the lab than I think is normal for other types of animal work <laughs> first of all getting the virgins is really just a timing thing it's not like you can tell if they're virgin or not no. you just have to get them in these windows of right after they develop but before they're sexually active would that be the way of saying it yeah, it's actually the males um, that mostly control it. So if you have a fully developed male, and so what they have to wait for is their outer kind of exoskeleton has to harden before they can mate. Um, otherwise, they're just too soft. They can't do it. Um, and so 
um, for males at 25 degrees, it takes eight hours for their exoskeleton to harden. Um, Got you. So how can you, how do you tell them apart? Under a microscope? Under a microscope and there's, I, I look at their genitalia. Um, so they have very, very different uh, kind of anatomy in lots of different regards. But one of the main ones is that they have like um, an external kind of crown like structure on the males that you could see at the, the base of their uh, abdomen. And it's, it's just really obvious. And then females don't have that. So. Are, so is your neck permanently bent from looking through the microscope? <laughs> uh, no, because I make sure I have proper microscope sitting posture, which is with a straight back. So I lower my seat. I'm, I'm actually a tall person. So I have to lower my seat all the way to the as low as it can possibly go. And then under the microscope, I, I stack things until I get to the exact right height where I'm only just looking through the eyepiece with a straight back. Um, you have to be very, very picky about these things because I was getting back problems and then the here at the university, they have occupational health and they're like, oh, wild well, ears, because you're not sitting properly at the microscope. So now I have no excuse. They told me how to fix it. So I, I'm very, very, very careful about it. I, I wish that I had thought about it because I spent, I got started getting back problems from looking through the microscope. Like it's such a, you can, you can sit there, especially when you're looking at slides or something. I mean, you can sit there for hours taking oh, pictures. Yeah. yeah, that's like most of my days. I would say up to, they uh, They also try and limit me. But I, like, yeah, I, I would say, some, I, I'm not actually, no, I'm not going to admit how much time I spend on a microscope, but like different types of microscopes too, because there's just like the fly ones where you're in like a fly lab and you have the typical dissecting microscope or it's it's quite uh, it doesn't zoom in very much and then you have like confocal microscopes so I spend a lot of time at the confocal microscope as well and yeah it's hours it's hours just sitting there and you go through take a picture back to the microscope and yeah it's a lot of a lot of time at microscopes yeah the confocal and the confocal too is I mean it's a shared microscope so when you have time booked you have to use that time because you know if it's a heavy use microscope, you might oh, not yeah. be able to get time right away again. Oh yeah, people are also vicious about it. So you have to be on time as well. <laughs> you do. Um, and you yeah. need to clean up the microscope and set it up back to the way it's supposed to be. God, that used exactly. to drive me nuts. People leave really? all the filters in the wrong places and yes. Yes. Actually, yeah, I have to admit just last week, I got upset about the microscope. <laughs> 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 Because I found I found liquid on the 10x, and then I was like, "How? Oh, what, what is this?" Exactly, um, and even the oils. Like people would oh. bring their own microscope oil, and students don't realize those oils are only meant. You can only use the one type once a lens has been exposed to one uh, type of oil, unless you clean it perfectly. You can't put a different oil on it or it'll polymerize over the lens and it ruin a $5,000 objective. Oh yeah. No, there's, it's, it's, yeah, we have, we have really, really strict um, microscope uh, people now at my, at my new institute. So it's really, really lucky that they are like, they're very, very careful about um, how we treat these beautiful machines. Um, yeah. Cause it, you know, they're probably upwards of a million dollars if it has all of the bells and whistles on it, you know, with all the different laser lines and filters and whatnot. I mean, it's an expensive piece of equipment, but awesome. Yeah, I love them. I, I, I'm, I, I'm working with one of the best ones that's currently made, and I absolutely, I love it. It's, it's yeah, it, it makes life really really also easy when you have something that takes beautiful pictures you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time trying to make it look good it just it it does its job basically. do you have a zeiss uh, no we have the stellaris um, oh that's a good one too though that's a really good one so <laughs> yeah the Leica. yeah it's really good so maybe you could explain to everybody why fruit flies are kind of one or not kind of they are just one of the best genetic model systems that we can use in biology 
Well, the, this is multifactorial, but the biggest reason, it, it was actually just pure luck um but that melon gaster that um uh, morgan who was the person the first person who started working on flies um i believe it was in columbia before you um before the fly labs kind of dissipated to caltech area uh but it they just started keeping these different looking uh melon gaster and this was actually pure luck melon gaster is great it is one of the easiest to work with animals uh, maybe not as easy as worms or um, uh, there there are other animals that are much more easy to work with but it's it's just that it was the the animal of choice um, and they were maintained and studied for the longest period of time because it is the the very first basically uh, model organism and um, one of the first to have its genome sequenced and um, has been worked on just for so long as a model that it makes it the easiest just because so many tools have been developed and so much is known about um, their exact times of development, they, how they mate, um, just everything, how they develop, their development has been, there's been Nobel Prizes won for uh, mapping out its development and how this occurs um so there's just so it's just been worked on for so long that it makes it kind of the easiest just just out of nature um but there are easier animals to work with i would say by far like worms are easier to work with um but even i mean and worms do have amazing tools now but if you were to rewind the clock 10 years ago there was by far fruit flies had the best genetic tools of any organism like now they have the worms that... oh but that's debatable though like, really why Tell me. because they have like their rnai actually works whereas in flies it's i feel as though it's quite dubious but in uh, <laughs> in 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 nematodes you can you can usually often just put it into their media and then bingle bangle done like it and then it just actually works um, so they, they have these kind of tools available. They have CRISPR working, I believe. They have all sorts of different things and they don't have a lot of the same difficulties as flies, like, and their generation time also is very, very quick. Um, yes. Just so everybody so worms, knows, or... RNAi is interfering RNA that uh, if you put it into a cell, it will target a specific transcript that then will delete that specific protein temporarily from the cell exactly yeah and um it's it, it's really really useful because if you want like a temporary a timed kind of knockout or knockdown or it's it's a lot more possible with those guys than i would say in in drosophila but it and then how they're cultured and like, oh, there's lots of things that are really nice about worms so worms is one of and i believe worms had the first genome sequence and they also had their whole cell, like their whole uh, cell lineage mapped as well. Yeah, First, every cell's um, been mapped at this point. Every neuron, every cell's been mapped. They have worms now that have different colors in every lineage of cell that you can just look at it under the microscope and know what yeah, exactly what cell you're looking at. Yeah, they're they're really good. So I don't know, like there's 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 this divide in a lot of scientists that of like the worm people versus the fly people because. I don't think that anybody else can say like their model organism is easier to work with than worm or fly. Was probably worm or fly, um, and I would say I don't know. There are good things with both. If you could use both, that would be awesome. The fly is a little bit more complex. I mean, that's for sure, yeah. and that does give you a since it's more complex. It has more of the networks that higher organisms have, where some of those networks are just not necessarily absent, but much less developed in the worm than they are in the yeah. fly. So yeah, I can definitely see it. it's it's yeah. But it's, it depends yeah, on what it you're depends on what at. you're studying. Yeah, yeah. If you could go simpler, it's always better to go simpler um, and and fit your kind of study to the animals that have always had this animal and try and force studies into them, um, which I think is is the better way of going about it. If you look at what you want to study and say like, oh no, this animal is the best, best animal to study this in, then, then you would do that instead of like, oh, 
I love flies. What can I study in flies? Like it's, it's just one of those kind of things. It's a different approach. And I think a lot of people are moving into the kind of approach where you, you pick your organ instead of just specializing in one model organism that you need to diversify it and be able to work in a whole bunch of different organisms. And then um, based on what you're studying, which one fits best. And I think that that's the way we're kind of going with research in the future, or at least that's the way I'm doing it. <laughs> But, but it's nice if you can, for sure, like zebrafish, another great model organism. But each one of, I mean, flies are relatively cheap to set up. Worms are fairly cheap to set up. But as soon as you get into fish and things like this, oh, yeah. and especially, I've heard about some of the, do you have euthanasia rules for flies in Britain? Because no. in Australia, they have euthanasia rules for fish. I, that makes sense to me. I think that they all vertebrates here and cephalopods. I believe. Uh, but, I believe that we have rules for those as well. But yeah. the way that they make you euthanize them sounds worse than the ways that you would actually normally use. Like it's kind of crazy. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. I, I would have to go back and watch it. But she was describing it to me, and I kept shaking my head like this is really expensive to do for something that should be quite simple, like fish in an ice bath, easy to do and yet, and should be painless. Like there's, there's, there, there were ways that she was discussing it that I was like, Oh my goodness. Like it really actually seemed like you were torturing the animal before. Yeah. You yeah. I wonder about that too. Like it, the quickest thing is just to. Uh, Decapitation is still yeah. the quickest. Yeah. But. And probably at least like, I don't know. It depends if they know, because that's what they do in mice. I guess they, they disconnect the vertebrae. Yes. Um, I've had to do rabbits and rats and mice and I didn't, I don't enjoy any animal research. No, I, I don't. don't. I don't. However, yeah. I, you, it's impossible not to use it. So. It's quite I, difficult. I, I like mine because I'm keeping like, at least in, well, not my current work, but my, my fruit fly work. Um, I'm just I'm just making really old flies. I do kill all the males though. That's true. But yeah. like I, <laughs> um, yeah, but they they're death by alcohol. So I think that this is the the least mean way to go. Is they and, just and they love alcohol. In. Fruit flies. They, they do love, love it. Fruit alcohol. flies are crazy for it. Um, so I, I they get death by alcohol. The males and then the females they just live a very old life with a bunch of other females. So I think that it's 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 kind of the nicer end of the research uh, for the most of the flies. Some of them, other things happen, yes, but. So let me ask you this. So why parthenogenesis? Why did you start studying it? And what is parthenogenesis? So parthenogenesis is the development of an unfertilized egg. Um, so it only has, it doesn't have the male genome or the male sperm, um, not, nothing like that. And it, uh, the, it's the initiation of development and continued development um, of unfertilized eggs. And basically what they end up with is two copies or more of the maternal genome um, making up the new animal. So it is kind of clone-like, but it's not. Um, because uh, at least in my case, um, they undergo recombination and all of that kind of stuff. So they aren't exactly precise matches and they have ploidy changes. So they have uh, not like the mother, which will have two copies of the genome. Sometimes they can have three or four copies and, and also have two copies. Um, so parthenogenesis is this development and then you can get different levels of parthenogenesis. So some only die as embryos, others make it to different stages of reproduction. Some you can get whole alive animal um, out. And there are different types of parthenogenesis as well. So there are animals that only reproduce by parthenogenesis. And then there are animals that can switch between. Um, and I studied the ones that could switch between. So the ones that would typically normally have sexual reproduction, um, but can do parthenogenesis if no males are around and the opportunity to mate does not present itself. Um, so and there this, are some this, lizards, oh, I'm sorry, but there are some lizards that do that, right? That are oh, loads, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whiptail uh, lizards, there's obligate ones. Uh, the whiptail lizards in, I believe it's Arizona or it's it, down in the southern states there um, in the desert like southern states. They have lizards that can do that and they have just whole colonies of these female whiptail lizards. Um, but other lizards can actually as well, like Komodo dragons, they can do facultative parthenogenesis, which means this is the, the switching one. Um, so that's pretty cool. And I believe that there are more examples in, in, in lizards, uh, but like lots of snakes, they have found a caiman recently. There's this very famous caiman um, that was in all the newspapers. And, uh, and, and this one, it didn't develop to adulthood, but it did get development in an egg, which was crazy and cool and unexpected. Um, lots of animals can do it. We actually don't know how many animals are capable of doing this. Um, it's probably way more than actually just uh what we've seen because you aren't like we don't often take uh female animals and then sexually isolate them and see if they're able to do it it's just you, you see it in zoos basically when we see it in animals we often just see it in zoos or in laboratory settings because it it's it's hard to observe that in nature so why did you choose this as a study to to look at or as a topic to investigate uh i became obsessed um, so I, like I tried, I spent a lot of time thinking about this because I know why I started studying it, um, later on in life, but the first time I heard about it, I think I was quite young and I remember, cause I used to be, I don't know, I was a weird kid. So I was watching always the nature discovery channel. Um, and then there was one about, I believe it was sailfish or Merlins, or there was a, a type of, not Merlin, um, I believe it was a sailfish. Is that a marlin? Yeah, marlins are a type of sailfish, yes. Yeah. And so um, these ones, they genetically tested them, and then they found in the wild that facultative parthenogenesis had occurred. And I can't remember how old I was when I saw this. In my mind, I was young, but I could have been like 20. I don't know. <laughs> um, and, um, that is still young. I'm a, but uh, I, I remember that, uh, reading that or seeing that on TV and, and being absolutely awestruck and thinking like, this is crazy. This is, uh, this is absolutely insane. It, it didn't occur, you assume that all animals are like humans and that they must sexually re reproduce. Um, but actually we might be the weird ones and all animals might be able to do this facultative parthenogenesis thing. Parthenogenesis thing. And, um, and 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 it might not actually be as uncommon as 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 we think it might be, but um, I, I, well, I remember there's, that there is one example of uh, facultative parthenogenesis in human history. Oh no, but that's a miracle! <laughs> that, like, because I always have, I've had, like, I've talked about this a few times, and people are like, "What about Jesus?" And then the whole principle of Jesus would be that it was. Um, a miracle like some divine that intervention yes yeah exactly so that's why it's so special is that it was a miracle it was an actual parthenogenesis um it, it was it, it was supposed to be something that was a magnificent thing um so very very different uh i don't so i don't think that that uh resist <laughs> <laughs> that mary was a lizard but like um this is mainly lizards or like pe animals that have their eggs outside of their body basically non-mammals so non-mammals can most likely most of them can do it I, I i would guess if i were going to be a betting person knowing full well that we've not examined most animals i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna put it out there now and early and knowing full well that no one will actually be able to test this i would say most animals are probably capable of that don't have their eggs inside of their body so, so frogs and salamanders, so amphibians and reptiles and birds. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll bet you if you look, I'll bet you there is a bird already. And if there is, I'll put it. Oh, there is. There's condors. Um, uh, condors can. There are turkeys, chickens. Uh, but, and these are probably not, this is just the ones that we have examples for. So this is, it's definitely in birds. Um, so I, I think you're, you're, you're probably right. And maybe even in something like uh, the platypus or something maybe that one's gonna be a difficult one like yeah you know there there are always these 
marsupials are funny and monotremes, these, these you never really know about. So I'm not going to say, yeah, I would say they're, they're, they're a wild card. I, I probably not for them. I don't know if, um, Ooh, maybe that's your know. next area of research. You get to work with platypuses. <laughs> oh, well, I would love that, but they apparently are very poisonous. So. Yes. <laughs> uh, they have the, the talons that, uh, yeah, yeah. Feet that are very, well, everything in Australia is poisonous pretty much. Yes. Yes, of course. No, I would want to work with them because yeah, I'm, let's just say I'm happy that mammals don't do carcinogens. <laughs> um, because if, but what, what's required when you're working on something scientifically is for you to often, like at least you need to do some uh, looking at their anatomy and stuff like that. And I'm okay with doing that on most things, but not mammals. Um, and so, uh, or, or uh, marsupials, which are mammals. But like, yeah, it's, um, yeah, but oh well, yeah, anyway. Uh, so why did I start studying it? Um, I got obsessed with it in my PhD, actually. Uh, I had, I had a, I always tell the same story. I had this friend that was taking off to Colorado for a ski trip and he had these praying mantids that he bought in an insect fair, because I guess they have those here. Um, and he needed somebody to take care of them. And so I agreed to, I love, I love insects. So I agreed to take care of these praying mantids. Um, and they're for so him. cool. They are so cool. They're lo they're really actually sweet creatures. Um, and I used to let them. They eat human hair, at least the ones that I uh, was caring for. And they used to crawl in my hair and sometimes like just cut off a piece of hair and eat it, which seems gross, but it's actually really cool. Um, and so I had all these praying mantids that I was taking care of. And then he came back and he was like, "Oh, you could just keep looking after them. You know, I have a lot going on or whatever." Anyway, this guy left me with all these mantids. And I started like rearing them and eventually started mating them, see if I can get some more mantids and, and, and caring for them quite a lot. And um, I had one that did parthenogenesis. So she had never mated and then she created an uthika or an egg case. And um, I thought nothing of it because I thought like, oh, it's not gonna hatch or nothing will come out of it. And, but then, you know, not that many, but quite a few of them actually came out uh, praying mantids and a lot of them were relatively weird yes but uh quite a few of them actually made it all the way to the final stage of development for them um because they go through molts and they develop further and they get bigger and stuff like that um and so I, I was kind of obsessed with them from that regard it was just always in my mind like parthenogenesis and then when I started my first postdoc I started working on cell cycles in eggs and this is kind of where parthenogenesis occurs is in eggs uh, and it is a misregulation of the cell cycle. So I kept kind of coming up against it again and again, um, seeing kind of things that could lead to parthenogenesis because a lot of people who study cell cycle in eggs, they think about like, how is it prevented from initiating? How do you prevent the animals from starting to develop without sexual reproduction? Um, and so it just kind of, coalesced my personal interest and 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 my love of, of um animal eggs basically and then uh, my knowledge of the cell cycle and animal further development and then yeah I, I started thinking about it and I was coming to the end of my very first postdoc and I approached my um second postdoc supervisor David um to ask him if he thought my idea of studying this um in Drosophila was a good idea and he's like yeah yeah I think so and then I was like oh can you give me some money and he's like no but I'll teach you how to write a grant like yeah, you have to get your way if you, if you if you want to study this you have to learn how to make like get money and and I kind of also approached with him like oh I don't know if I'd like to be uh like run my own research program or all of that and he's like well you can you know, a lot of what you do is you write grants and then you come up with ideas, you supervise people, you look at their ideas and help them sharpen it, you question them, even if you don't know everything about what they're doing, you you kind of, you develop them um, and kind of push them so that they can continue developing themselves. And so, yeah, so I, I went to him and we wrote the grant together. Um, I mainly wrote it and then he mainly told me it was terrible. And then... <laughs> over and over and over again <laughs> until it finally goes good um as 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 it should be actually because this was incredibly useful ex exercise like this is how someone teaches you how to how to do it properly um because if you just think like oh i'm going to write a grant and think you're going to be good at it no it's incredibly tricky actually 
Um, it is, but uh, and we can talk about that. I think at the end <laughs> because there's there are there's a way we write grants now, and then maybe there's a way that grants should be written, and yeah. they're not they're not the same because people spend an inordinate amount of time writing grants, which if you're doing that, you're not doing the science. And what are we oh, paid exactly. to do? You're paid to be a scientist, not to be a grant writer. So we can talk about that. It's <laughs> on that. But so yeah, but yeah. So that's how I came into studying the parthenogenesis. So then how did you design your experiment or how did you figure out the mechanism you were going to use to find the parthenogenic genes? Like clearly you're okay. using Drosophila so that you can modify the genes and find out which ones were important. How did you design that and you know, what did you find? It was incredibly difficult to design this because this hasn't obviously had never been done before. Um, so that's when like, it seems really, really clear cut at, when you're writing the paper and at the end, but to get to that point was actually incredibly difficult. So initially I was just going to, because I had, it was Drosophila, Drosophila Mercatorum I chose to work in. Um, there's all these tools av available in Melanogaster. And so I just assumed that these tools would work, uh, like all these antibodies, all of these various different things that I can kind of start looking at the development of um, parthenogenic flies and in, in Mercatorum. But unfortunately, none, none of it worked. So like, I started looking at them and what I had originally planned and actually put in the grant and everything was initially comparative and then starting to get into kind of tinkering with the genetics, um, basically using melanogaster as a model um and and nothing i tried worked i tried to establish crispr in mercatorm couldn't do it it just would not would not work um i tried to get antibodies to work would not work and then i i kind of had to go back to the drawing board and reformat how i was going to study it and then i got a way better idea which was to start with the genome like maybe it will be really obvious if I compare the genomes, what genes are different. So I compared the, uh, looked at the genome and looked at the transcriptomes um, and it wasn't really obvious still. <laughs> and then I was, I was like, oh, I need to test these, but I can't, transgenics doesn't really work. CRISPR is not really working in Mercatorum. And then I had the idea to just start screening it in Melanogaster and, and thought that this was in fact a better idea because Melanogaster is obligately sexual. So if I'm able to turn them uh, parthenogenic, then that's an actual really good proof uh, of, of what I was looking at. So it wasn't actually- The best like, proof, the best proof. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it wasn't actually straightforward. It was everything else that I tried didn't work. And then I eventually got there, um, but I did get there quite quickly. So we started with the genomics quite like after only maybe a few months or whatever, but it still was like really, really annoying uh, to begin with of how, how to work it out. Um, but it was just, yeah, it was because nothing else would have worked. <laughs> this is, this is how I got there. I got there through trying other things and having it fail. And then I came to the conclusion the only way to do it was that way. Um, and I'm sure there maybe there was a better way to do it, but I, I can't think of a better way to do it because I really sat down and thought of the only really reasonable cost-effective way to be able to handle this problem. Um, and I was very, very lucky that it worked because it's a very high risk set of experiments. Because if you're screening parthenogenesis, it takes more or less six months for each gene that you're screening and if you it, like some people have looked at my paper and they go to table 6a and 6b um and it is horrible how many experiments i did how many different genotypes it's hundreds um and and tested all of those so it's to go through and do that was it took years and it was extremely painful um, and uh, i had a high risk of failing which would have yeah potentially ruined my career um, but then, yeah, it, it eventually worked, which was really surprising. It was polygenic, which I, like, I was quite, so someone may have suggested to me that my experiments had failed after I did the first genes, only one single gene, um, because I didn't really see much parthenogenesis. Wait, wait, what if I combine them? Um, How did you did decide kind of... which genes to combine? Like, so you went through the experiment, you took a bunch of genetically altered flies 
yeah. you just tested them for parthenogenesis. Yeah. And so, and you did hundreds of them. And I know what you mean. I do know what you mean. I've done similar things in my life and it is brutal because yeah. not only are you working so hard because it's just a lot of man time or woman time, whatever you want to call it. Uh, human time. <laughs> human time. But it's also that you do have this uh, fear of failure hanging over your head the whole time because none of it has to work in the end. You can put a year and a half in, or two years into a study like this and end up with the only thing you can say is that none of these genes directly are responsible for what I was looking for. And exactly, I still think that that's a success in my personal opinion, because you're showing that it's much more complicated than what you think, but you'll never get that paper published because it's not positive enough. You don't have, you know, it's so hard to publish a negative study. Meanwhile, I think every negative study should actually be published because- So I, I think like, I agree with you every day na- because that it also, it saves people from going down the same road over and over and over again. Like yes. that's the, the most important thing. I think we should be publishing our negative results, but also you have to be confident that you tested it, it, it tested this in the right way. So I think like if for me to say like, oh, I tested all these genes and none of them worked, then you would have that question. Did you test them in the right way? You can't really conclude that they don't work. You can just conclude that the way you did it in this set of, of ways didn't give you this result. But you're still stopping somebody from doing it that exact way. And that yeah. is how most people would do it. They would start the way you started, which is to take this fly bank of all these different mutants and just start going through them. So I'm not sure if anyone would do it because nobody has ever done that. Uh, well, that's true. That's <laughs> true. I don't want to steal your thunder because it was is no, a, no, no, no. like it's a super clever experiment. But the clever part is how, and I want to know this: How did you? pick out DSAT2, Polo, and Mick from all of that data you collected to be, these are the ones that are likely to have an influence. And I'm sure it had to be multifactorial decision, not just, I saw this out of the data and this is the ones I chose. So the DSAT ones, um, that one, was the most different one of the most differentially expressed and um it wasn't just that one there were a couple other desaturases in there that kind of were on the edge of interesting and so that's why i picked it i picked it for that reason and because i had to pick it like a few randoms and then the other ones i picked i picked very 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 deliberately so and this is knowing full well how the cell cycle works in the eggs and things that were likely to be involved So Polo we picked um, because it could basically take over the job of um, a bunch of the genes that we did see as differentially expressed. So we're we're after centriol centrosome genes because we know in uh, at least parthenogenic Drosophila mercatorum that the centrosomes form de novo. So we know that there is something happening there. So we had to look through all the the genes where centrosomes were involved um, potentially. And we did, we got a handful of them. And from that handful, um, I could have, I did test some of them individually, but then I thought if it's all of them, if all of these need to be differentially expressed in, in like a very subtle different ways, then that's going to be hard to recapitulate. So in the end, I decided a shotgun approach and just did polo, um, which does control a lot of the same kind of processes that all of these were doing. So that one, um, Mick was kind of also, it was one, it was actually the very last gene I tested. Um, and it was because I came up against all of these and looking at it and spending a lot of time thinking about it and evaluating because of what a lot of people do when they do screening of this sort is they go for the most differentially expressed genes, have a cutoff of two um, log uh, to the base two full difference in gene expression as their minimum kind of differential expression and then everything higher or much lower than that plus or minus that um, is what they screen and then I thought about it more and 
what if you screen all of those and those are just kind of consequences? Maybe they aren't actually the thing that is causing it to occur in the first place. And then another thing is that parthenogenesis is a very subtle phenotype. Like you wouldn't expect it to be an extreme change. You would expect it, and especially in animals that naturally do it, you don't expect them to be like, oh, suddenly extreme change in the animal. No, you're expecting something very subtle. And so it was only after like getting a whole bunch of negative results, spending some time going back to the drawing hole, thinking about it a little bit more, then I opened up my parameters and looked for cell cycle genes that were only subtly changed very very subtly changed and then i i found nick and then i tested nick um and and it it sh shockingly it worked and i tested it multiple different ways i didn't just test it in one way i tested it with like broad overexpression I, deficiencies um a whole bunch of different ways and i was consistently seeing like oh yes this is definitely doing something like oh fantastic but um, they were, to me, they were all kind of obvious after the fact, but I did spend like years doing this, <laughs> screening, getting a bunch of negative results, being like, ah, oh, my life is ruined. Hindsight is twenty twenty. This is true. Yeah. Were you surprised that uh, these three genes, uh, number one, are all hub proteins or what I would call network hub proteins? I mean... DSAT2 clearly uh, works on lipid metabolism, but uh, polo, polo kinase, right? Yeah. So phosphorylates thing, and then MYC also a kinase. So these are... So MYC is a transcription factor. A transcription factor, I'm sorry. Yeah. So you have a transcription factor, a kinase, and a modulator of lipid metabolism. And that's... And they're all multifunctional uh, proteins, they do a lot, and all of them are, and I found this interesting, maybe you can tell us if there's a link, all of them are oncogenes in humans, which is really interesting. DSAT2? Yes, it's, and so it's, uh, it's homolog in human is SCD1. It's uh, 70, 60 something percent identical and 70 something percent uh, homologous. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't looked at. Um, are you Actually, sure about DSAT too? I'm positive because I took the gene and I put it into blast, okay. ran it, and then got the protein and then. Look, there's thousands of papers on, and there's many, many drugs that are being developed to uh, DSAT or uh, to SCD1. And the interesting thing is all of those drugs are really bad. Like none of them really work for cancer because they're just, the drugs are as toxic as uh, the disease itself. Or at least it's... Yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, you are correct. Um, I hadn't looked into it because I never, I didn't look at, um, it just never occurred to me to look in human. It's because mammals don't do <laughs> parthenogenesis. So I always just think of like, what is it doing in flies? Um, because it has these really fascinating functions, other functions in flies. But um, yeah, they are all oncogenes, yes. If, if um, I have to look into the papers more, but it's um, definitely MYC is. MYC is the most famous oncogene. Um, yes. It's, and, and polo is a proto-oncogene. If you do overexpress polo, it can, um, in combination with other things, lead to tumor genesis. So, yeah. And all I, of them are, are very, cannot really be dealt with through pharmacology. Like, they're such, they're such, uh, global hubs to the networks that they're in that messing with any of those proteins not only is going to cause a problem with the tumor cell that you're trying to get rid of it's also going to create problems in your normal cells i mean this is kind of this is what the literature has borne out yeah yeah that, that's definitely true of um Make is incredibly hard to deal with, and and so is polo. A lot of well, all, obviously, cancer is hard to deal with. <laughs> um, it's right. a very very tricky thing because you're fighting yourself basically. 
um, or at least part of yourself that cho chose to be different and so well, chose to or changed but like yeah it's 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 one of these things um there is like a very long standing connection between parthenogenesis and uh cancer so that's what i was hoping you would know because i don't but it just seems obvious that if the three genes that you can regulate in a fly are all big oncogenes in humans there's likely some existing connection that's already known or thought about even if it's not known so it's been thought about since i think some of the first mentions between uh cancer and parthenogenesis i saw it like really early ones from like the uh 1900 early 1900s oh, wow. um where people were, were pointing this out because they they had really like that connection is 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 quite old um and quite long thought of and finding these type of genes in 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 as causing parthenogenesis is unsurprising um but also it's it's it kind of reinforces that connection maybe a little bit more um but it is kind of expected because what is happening in the egg is a misregulation of the cell cycle the egg comes to the end of development and should wait for the other half of the anim another animal's genome the male's genome to recombine and then initiate development and so it's risky for unless you can unless there's some sort of benefit that you can get which there is but uh for it, development to start initiating in eggs because especially if it starts before the egg has left the female's body then it's incredibly risky to do that right yes. um and so it's it there is this kind of dance between the um the risks versus the benefits in in this kind of this form of reproduction and then and how how and that's why i think it's mostly occurring in animals that have the eggs that hatching outside of the body um because it, when parthenogen is less of a detrimental thing and less of a risk in, in these types of animals um if 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 they have kind of like a, a type of development like drosophila melanogaster but yeah the connection to cancer is kind of expected just because it is an aberration of the cell cycle basically it or a change in the cell cycle so the cell cycle has to change in cancer and it has to change in parthenogenesis so it's dealing with the same kind of fundamental process yeah I, yeah it makes a lot of sense actually uh I wonder if the flies might be uncover some interesting aspects of cancer or through parthenogenesis because of the subtle regulation that you're seeing. I'm wondering, you know, and by the way, I never would have thought about something as simple as, well, the animal needs to get rid of the egg before it starts dividing or you have problems. I never would have thought of that, but it makes <laughs> perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, there are kind of, these are really old papers I haven't looked at in a while, but there are ones of like, it's like the teratoma formation in ovaries and stuff like that. It's kind of, that's kind of a similar, it's, it's not that, it's not the same, but it's kind of a similar process to uh, parthenogenesis where you start getting like this aberrant development. Um, in in germ cells so this is not this is not good when it happens in like mice um and 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 stuff so this is it's not um but i don't i don't believe that that's the same thing as parthenogenesis but it's a similar like process that's happening there um which is well, uncontrolled cell division well basically. maybe you could tell us a little bit about your uh model that you came out with in the paper because and i'll put it up right here uh because it's really interesting, like from all of these studies that you did and all the flies you looked at and all the tests that you did under the microscope, you actually came out of it with a real model of what's <laughs> going on that you can see under the microscope. So it's a pretty good model. We can, it's, it's still a model. Um, it's still a model, I, but it's I'm a pretty good I'm always very one. cautious cautious about um what i think is actually happening um so in the paper I, I just say that this is a a place to start um what we think is happening is that it starts with mick we think mick is doing it's a transcription factor so it can't actually be doing anything active itself it doesn't do anything active it causes genes that are 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 active genes can i stop to do you just one things. second 
Yeah. It only, it's a trans, it, it's known function is a transcription factor. How yeah, many other no functions other Mick has, completely unknown. Because I'm of the school that every protein is multifunctional, every single one. Every single one has more than two functions, in my opinion. Yes, I can see, definitely see your side of it. Um, for the things that we know about Mick. For what we know about Mick, for sure. Yeah, for what we know about Mick, it's a transcription factor. And so it, as far as we know, and, and yeah, uh, there's, the, in this situation, we believe what it is doing is leading to increased transcription of genes involved in um, growth, basically, and development. And it does all this transcription in the egg because the egg in Drosophila is basically a powerhouse of transcription. The egg undergoes insane amounts of transcription to, de to pack the, um, the embryo, basically, as it starts to develop full of everything it needs to go through the first 14 rounds of cell cycle. And um, having extra MYC, what we propose is that it's leading to increased transcription, so increased amount of stuff there ready for the process to begin. And then also MYC acts afterwards. Um, so I think I actually what, what I should what I should have started with is MYC is not the essential one. So the essential two things are polo and DSAT. So these are sufficient to initiate parthenogenesis. MYC removed from that situation, it doesn't it it it's does it isn't necessary. So we see pretty good amounts of parthenogenesis happening when you just have DSAT. Basically DSAT actually itself, you'll see small amounts of parthenogenesis. And then if you add in polo, you start seeing like real amounts of parthenogenesis. Animals making it to the end of development, you get adult flies. And then if you add in MIC, then you see a little bit more of larger numbers initiating development, but then you even see of those that initiate development, a larger proportion of them completed. So they make what we think MIC is doing is actually just enhancing the ability of the eggs to initiate development and um, with through its cell cycle transcription and stuff like that. And then later, the same thing, basically enhancing their ability to get past some of the pitfalls that happen with parthenogenic development. So Mick is doing kind of before and after, but then um, comes in DSAT. And what DSAT is doing is pretty much the most important thing. And what we saw in DSAT mutants and um, in the parthenogenic eggs was that the polar bodies which are uh, the, the other products of meiosis. You get the half genome that normally combines with the male, and then you have the three other products of meiosis. Those uh, don't do what they are supposed to do, which is go off to the cortex of the egg and just chill there and do nothing. And they become inactivated and they change, their biology changes. And normally that's what happens during normal sexual reproduction. Um, and in non-fertilized eggs usually. Um, uh, but when we have DSAT mutants, those polar bodies, stay close to the female pronucleus and stay very, very proximal. So, and, and we know that they recombine in the animals. So what it is doing is just putting them near each other. It's very, very simple. Like it's a very, very, very easy thing to be like, oh, well maybe, maybe the polar bodies are actually removed from eggs and put off to the side because they can do this. Because if they're near each other, they re and start development. So it's just a proximity thing. And we don't know exactly how DSAT is doing this. Uh, an easy theory is that it changes the membrane fluidity or membrane structure so that the transport is not as efficient. Um, because it's, it's the most reasonable explanation is not that the, the polar bodies go to the cortex and come back. It's the most reasonable or parsimonious that they just don't get sent there to begin with, and then just stay there and cause uh, re or triploidization or tetraploidization of, of the, of the and development of the animal. And then polo is quite simple. Polo is, what we see in the eggs is that it actually just forms centrosomes. So centrosomes are eliminated from almost all eggs um, as they develop, uh, including Drosophila. And what they normally, they um, either form de novo as they do in mouse, um, and I believe stick insects. And um, 
normally they're provided by the basal body of the male sperm. So the basal body is the thing the, that makes the sperm swim. And that actually has a second function of giving this thing that organizes the cell division, um, the centrosome or centrioles um, to the developing egg. So normally they need to be provided by the male sperm. Um, and what Polo is doing is just forming that structure de novo or itself. So we see the formation of these two centrosome structures at the ends of the dividing um, a cell or nuclei in the uh, Drosophila embryos. And it probably also has a second function in pushing the cell cycle because um, Polo also regulates the cell cycle as well. So it has a multi multifunctional, it is a very, very important uh, cell cycle regulator. So it probably is also involved a little bit in that, but this is what we propose is happening. Um, but it definitely needs more research to be really, really confident about what we well, think is happening there. Speaking, <clears throat> pardon me, speaking of, where does it, where do you go now? What's What's new on the horizon? for taking this project to the next step? Um, I am, yeah, grunt writing. <laughs> um, I, have, uh, I have some things in the works, but I've started a third postdoc where I am learning about crop pests because I've become fascinated with crop pests um, because a lot of Parthenogenic animals are pests, um, and and you don't really think about this, but it's not just not just crop pests, but also like if you think about there was this marble crayfish which was somehow found in like a German aquarium in the nineties. Um, theoretically, because we don't know where it came from or how it was made, we probably did it. We probably somehow selected for or created this parthenogenic animal. And they, it has since been released into different populations, like in Madagascar, Madagascar, it's taken over entire rivers, streams, killing off the, the native species and actually changing uh, the ecology of these. So it's not just ruining uh, for native other crayfish, but actually they're, what they're feeding upon, all of that kind of stuff, changing the whole ecosystem. And because they're parthenogenic, they can breed at twice, they have twice the reproductive output because they don't waste any time on males. So they just make more and more females, which can make more and more females. And it's absolutely insane. So I'm, I've, I've become kind of obsessed actually uh, with understanding invasive species that are parthenogenic and crop pests that are parthenogenic. Like some of the worst ones in the world are actually parthenogenic. Um, so I wonder like, do, are they just attracted to our, our fantastic greenhouses or are we somehow creating these animals? And this is part of a, something that's like a knock-on effect of the advent of um, agriculture as we know it, which is actually a recent thing, which is why you'll probably see problems like this arising around now, um, because we've only been farming in this way for the last less than 100 years. Let's, using let's, pesticides. let's, let's, let's break that <laughs> egg open. I've been waiting okay. for you to get here. Let's crack this thing. <laughs> because this is so important. <clears throat> the first thing that you mentioned, which given we have 100 years of failures, I don't know of any true successes in trying to take foreign species and use them beneficially in, in a different environment that has never worked. And you can point to rabbits in Australia, cats in New Zealand, crayfish in Madagascar, carp in uh, England. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of how humans in our arrogance have tr thought that we could play God and introduce new species into an environment. Oh, pythons in Florida. You know, how, how we <laughs> terrible can, idea. <laughs> terrible, terrible idea. So that's number one. But the more important one, number two, is we are using all of these chemicals, which are, they say, oh, they've been tested. No, nothing's been tested for a chemical in the environment until 100 years later. That's yeah. actually when it's been tested. And yet we are using atrazine, which causes feminization in men, humans, let alone what it could possibly be doing to all the animals. And oh, wait, let's just not forget microplastics because of humans' obsession with plastic. 
that we just cannot seem to get enough of it. And all Hopefully of Hopefully that's ending. <laughs> well, one would hope, one would hope, but I think it, without scientists coming out and being the alarm bell and mass saying, no, look, people, we're, the, we're supposed to be the experts. Allow us to be the, the real experts for one minute and say that this obsession with plastic is literally destroying our planet and all of the life that's on it. And it's warping it in ways that we cannot understand. And one of them, it can definitely be through modifying the sexual behavior of animals. In particular, animals that will eat our crops, that will parasitize our food sources, whether it be mammal or fish or fowl. And this is ongoing at a rate never observed in human history right now. Oh, it's because we're in, uh, eff effectively what we're doing is we're heavily selecting for these things because of our war on these animals. So these animals, maybe we're attracted to something to begin with, um, and then they live there and then we're trying to kill them and our methods of trying to kill them will inevitably put selection pressure on them. And Maybe so you could I, explain what selection pressure is, because I think people hear this term, but they don't really understand it. And ultimately, if you don't understand it, you don't realize that selection pressure always wins. So I, 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 I will start, I will explain it through a scenario, because I think that that's the easiest way to understand things. So I, and I will use the tomato leaf miner. So this is a moth that is from Brazil and um, it loves tomatoes. It really is super into tomatoes. It likes the juicy fruit and their beautiful leaves. And once you get an infestation, it basically wipes out your crop. Um, and so one of the methods that they chose to control them, they have an integrated method for controlling tomato leaf miners. So one of the methods was to disrupt their mating. What a great idea. And this is a healthy way to, to deal with them because it's not, it doesn't actually theoretically influence other animals. It's a really great way. So they flood the greenhouses with pheromones so that the males cannot find the females. Fantastic. Okay. So there, there's, 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 there's this great way of dealing with them. And then not just that, they also have an attractant one where they uh, attract um, basically the males and kill them all off. Really, really great. You're killing off all the males, cannot get them to reproduce. Fantastic. And then they have one last method um, where, what was it? Oh, there's three methods. Oh, no, I'm forgetting one. It's not um, that important if you can't remember. It's not that important, but they have another one that's basically preventing the males from meeting with the female. Okay, great. Um, but what you're doing is, stopping sexual reproduction from happening. You're removing all of the males from a situation. And then if you have, say, a female that's able to undergo a small amount of parthenogenesis, what you're doing is removing all the males. So the ones that survive into the next generation are only those that are able to do parthenogenesis. And that is selection pressure. So that puts pressure for this only. Otherwise, they will all die. So the ultimate goal was to kill them all because they didn't know, like, they didn't think of Parthenogenesis. So they thought, like, oh, you remove sexual reproduction, no more moth. Great, fantastic. But what actually happened was theoretically Parthenogenesis happening. And there's very little evidence for this because, like, even though this is a proven way in which they've dealt with them, there have been no proper studies. There's one pilot study that was dubious at best, but there have been no proper studies looking at putting this type of pressure on something, which is removing all males. So what I did in my study to cause parthenogenesis was remove all the males. This is a selection pressure. I've artificially put it on and then I saw parthenogenesis happening. So if you do stuff like that, you're putting in an artificial selection pressure for something because otherwise you will get nothing. So you, if you have no, if, if they only sexually reproduced, then all the animals would die if you would just remove all the males. But because they can do parthenogenesis, that's the selection pressure. Removing the males selects for parthenogenesis to occur. Um, and does that make sense? Is that- yeah, like, No, it makes that... perfect sense. And I think that what, what we need to discuss is that we don't, as, as humans, 
don't know as much as we think we know. And when we do these types of things where we're like, oh, this is genius, this is going to work, and we'll just eliminate them because there will be no way for them to reproduce. It, you know, I hate to quote Jurassic Park, but life finds a way. And life You're the second does. person to quote that to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. And life true. does it find a way. And if you don't consider that, then you end up with the problems that we're seeing. I mean, a, a friend of mine, uh, she developed the mosquitoes that they uh, released into. No. Yeah, the, the ones that caused. Now, I haven't followed up on that research, but I mean, Shirley was. I mean, a, a rock star of the science world for a few years because they really thought that this was going to end the mosquito problem. But as far as I know, mosquitoes are still just doing their thing and found a way around mosquitoes that are, too. Are capable of parthenogenesis. Um, again, I, I, I just, I, I, it's a good, yeah. There's been just so little study about other animals. We spend all of this time understanding ourselves, which is great, absolutely necessary. Now is the time to spend a little bit more time looking at all of the other animals around us and understanding like how, how can they reproduce? What are they doing? How can we be influencing them? Because it's not just these ones where we're just trying to kill them off. We also have to think of the consequences. What if we're successful? What if we kill off all the mosquitoes? What else are we killing? Like you don't know an animal. How does that impact predict, that? But... Okay. Yeah, exactly. Eat a thousand mosquitoes a night. You're taking exactly. away their major food source. So we're influencing things and tinkering with things before knowing the full consequences of them. And I think that how we are as humans are coming to a place where we are able to start thinking about this more broadly. And we, I, like, I think, first of all, I think humans are fantastic. We've come, if you look at the last 100 years, we've come so far in how we treat each other, how we're dealing with, with so much better, how we treat children. We don't have children working in factories anymore. Like we, we have done absolutely amazing things as humans. And now we have to start thinking a little bit more about our environment, how we affect other animals and all of that kind of stuff. Because, you know, we, we can now. There is less of a, a thing for survival than there was maybe 100 years ago. There's less need for child labor. There's less need for all of these things. And now we can move into a phase where we improve the way in which we interact with this world. And so I don't want to be down on humans. I think that this is a great opportunity to start thinking about these kinds of things that are very important of how, how we interact with our environment and, and things that we can do to kind of predict it better, hopefully with AI or something like that to predict and see like, oh, hey, this is potentially a problem in this animal. Oh, we should know how all animals reproduce because, you, you know, what if they stop? And then we have to be able to deal with that. Like, well, it's, I mean, with the amount of, <clears throat> with the amount of chemicals that we are putting in the environment constantly, which can impact sexual development. All right, birth control pills entering the water systems, all the antidepressants entering the water systems, which it affects libido in all animals, all animals. The, the atrazine that I mentioned, which sprayed on 70% of all corn in America. Then you have things like Roundup, which is on every grain in America that, uh, is killing your gut flora, which is also changing your uh, your sexual behavior, and it is because of its changing hormonal levels, and you know, and the microplastics, and and and, like we have to start thinking. I agree with you long term, and this is the question I want to pose to you. I'm curious to get your answer. Uh, are we at a point now where? slowing down would actually be speeding up. And what I mean by that is that instead of running studies and trying to get this instant gratification of this was done in a year, this was done in two years and all these publications for scientists, are we, would we be better off doing longer studies because 
we don't have to advance at warp speed anymore. We can stabilize how life runs right now pretty well. And if we were doing longer term studies, investing more into those types of things, we would actually know the answers of what this thing will really do to the environment 20 or 30 years later. Like we keep approving these pesticides and things like this in a year or two, not knowing what's going to happen in 30 years. Okay. I even- think I think that the best example would be of the medical industry industry. They have, um, they have, I think it was, Thalamine, thalamide, um, here where they had this um, nausea inducing or preventing. Um, thalidomide, yeah. Thalidomide, yeah, that's it. Uh, that's, they, they kind of did a fast rollout for this and then it caused all of these really, really terrible birth defects that really affected a lot of people's life in an extremely negative way. And this changed the way the medical industry was kind of run. It added more regulation. It added a lot of these very, very strict things that some of which except for where it didn't except, except for where it didn't. It didn't but in a lot of cases it added a lot of the phased trials in for a lot of medication which weren't really there before so it did it did ultimately push in that direction and i think this something more similar to like things that we brought, broadly release out into our environment definitely should be in place like i don't think like the major things like directly applicable to my work would be like biocides or whatever, most of which are actually quite healthy. Um, there, there were actually something that was invented and made for um, to prevent chemical, like general chemical use and stuff like that. So these these are actually some of the solution to the problem that we're we're having. But it's just I think more studies need to be on seeing all the potential outcomes much more like the phase trials like oh does it how could this influence this animal's reproduction or how does it in, how does it kill them well, does it just do kill you, them all indiscriminately and does it affect other animals like just have broader tests and then have it be done in a more regulated way not by like oh the chemical made this chemical and then the chemical company told me this chemical is safe that's not how it should work well like but then it should also work that they're more forward thinking because I'm sure if you ask the people that developed uh, antidepressants, if they thought there would be a detectable level of antidepressants in most water in 2023, they would have never, they would have thought you were crazy. Yet here we sit in 2023 and in many developed nations, most of the water has detectable levels of antidepressants in it, especially in cities. So, like we're not this is why i'm saying like we need we need to take more time in thinking about well what does what all does really need to be measured for something to be considered environmentally safe and rolled out yeah i know i agree with you like i i think that more more of a framework needs to be developed and definitely more like checks and balances in place to be like oh did you think of this you know we have this this thing in the uk and it's kind of an it's it's terrible for where you work but they have these uh, risk assessments and every time you do something you have to fill out a risk ass- assessment and like oh what are the potentials of risk well like and then you like usually when you're doing these i always think of like extremely silly ones of like the worst possible case scenario i could be sitting on the stool fall down break my arm and die like or you know you think about these kinds of things but it's kind of something like a proper risk assessment you should really really take in and 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 take in knowledge from lots of different fields so like i only use pesticides but this is applicable to all things i think like you know with pesticides you should look at developmental biologists you should look at entomologists you should look at like large animal biology how could this influence that you 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 could talk to people who actually are environmental um scientists as opposed to just biologists and and think and integrate all of these things across multiple different fields to say like, oh, are, what are the potential consequences? Can you see anything here? And, and really just look at it from a broader perspective. Um, I think I you think- touched on something super important there. And that is that if you're a drug company or you're 
a pharmacologist and what you're doing is developing drugs, shouldn't you also be working directly with environmental scientists? Shouldn't you also be working directly with developmental biologists? Shouldn't you also be working directly with engineers that make uh, the water treatment systems? I mean, shouldn't there just be yeah. more of a- Definitely community? the water treatment system. <laughs> Because like it, a lot of this stuff could probably be filtered, uh, but yeah, it's. <laughs> but but if if we had a, if there was more, com no different than the rest of society, if our communities were stronger and more integrated, it can mm -hmm. only benefit. But they always say, well, that's at the cost of speed. That's at the cost of the rate that discovery occurs. Who made it that discovery has to occur at warp speed at all times? Like, it's just a scheme say everybody's we trying still, to win. We don't need to, yeah. I think in that regard, when it comes to these, like, I think a lot of discovery needs to be modeled more. Like, we have these fantastic computers now. We have uh, artificial intelligence. We can we can come up with ways to to predict things a lot better and put more time into the technology and, and, and all of these types of things um, and then go and test them. It will also save time as well with testing and stuff like that. But I think that, that we need to put a lot more energy into like predicting environmental impacts of things um, in, into modeling and use, use that kind of science a little bit more, I think would be very, very helpful because I, and I also know exactly like, what I'm predicting, which unfortunately hasn't been studied yet, and I hope to study myself, is that if you put, if you remove all the males, of course, parthenogenesis will happen. Well, uh, any model will show you that as well. Like you would have, like if there, if there, if it's programmed correctly. I mean, the model only knows what you tell it. However, these new AI models, you can give it a base model, and then let it go learn, and then see what it learned, and then get rid of the places where it had illusions of what was going on and then yeah, run it again. We can be using this. And I think we will. Like I'm, I'm one of those uh, forever optimists. Like I, uh, oh, me I am too. extremely, I'm extremely yeah, optimistic too. about um, our future as, as humans. And I think that we will um, only continue to improve if you look at just how far we've come, like it's absolutely amazing. And I think we will, we will start doing this. We will start like integrating a lot of more of these things and into modeling and all of that. And then have to have actual people testing them afterwards, but you, you can save a lot of money, a lot of time by modeling it first. Um, and, 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 and really like come, come around to that. I think we just, we just haven't, I think this is, this is the point we're at where that shift will start happening now, I think. Well, let me ask you just a couple more questions and I'll let you off the hook. Okay. <laughs> but what what is it about science that you get up in the morning and you're like, I love being a scientist? I often don't think about it. I never think about it. Uh, but uh, why I haven't quit in spite of everything else, I have to think about. Um, I, I, I like thinking about problems. I love having something that I'm chewing on and like having like a problem that I'm trying to solve. And it does often drive me slightly insane. Like I'll wake up and have an idea and write it down quickly. Um, and I love that kind of feeling when your mind is just sitting there pouring over something, trying to figure out like, what is it? The puzzle, what is it? And a lot of it, like you do subconsciously, so you'll, you'll do your research, you'll have your thing and then it'll take you forever to kind of, you know, put the pieces together and build it. And I love that whole sitting there chewing on a problem. This is what I really like. I really like doing that. This is why I like to be a scientist and uh, figuring out problems. And and it's a never ending list. Like you'll never get to the end. Like you No, and I'll never get tired of it. I'd be bored if I didn't have these going. I don't know what I would do with all my time. Like what do I, I spend so much time thinking about any problem also like it could be very very simple things like I had a staining that didn't work but figuring out like it's a little tiny problem you can just sit there and be like well is it this is it that and you're like kind of reformatting it reshaping it looking at it from all the different directions and then you figure it out and then it's like ah yes it uh, is it's, it's, it's so satisfying I mean 
I don't think people realize scientists are very akin to monks in certain ways in that the amount of time that monks spend praying is probably roughly equivalent to the amount of time that scientists spend thinking. I think we're more like gamers. You know those gamers? <laughs> oh yeah, no, the gamers that die because they are they game for too long. <laughs> but they like they have this like long game. They, like every time they win, it's that satisfaction. Like every time when you you like ah oh, you've sifted it out and you found it, something that works, and then there's like an extreme level of satisfaction. I think. But but that's only because you've experienced ninety five percent failure beforehand. That's yeah, what makes it so sweet. The suffering. <laughs> the suffering. Well, yeah. now you're a Buddhist because it is the yeah. suffering is the suffering is, and you have to yeah, embrace you embrace it. the suffering. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's what science is. I think like you, it is the you don't succeed most of the time. Most of the time you fail. Um, but the times when you just get it, oh my goodness, there's nothing better in the world than. Actually. I mean, my, my example is I, if you have 10% of your experiments work, you're in the that top, high. you're yeah. in the top 10% of all scientists. Like, yeah. and that's real. And when you get a really good project where like, half of it works in the first run oh you've just hit the you know you've hit the home run of all home runs because that might only happen once in your whole career yeah if that i would assume if, if that. something like that happens <laughs> that something is wrong and that i have to check i i wouldn't believe that that kind of result <laughs> certain genetic experiments yeah. kind of work that way though like if yeah, you pick the right gene that's doing the thing you think and either overexpress it or eliminate it and you see exactly what you expected, you know, or something very close to it. Those are the ones that I question kind of the least because yeah. you already knew what it did. And okay. now you're just In that regard, like a repeat, then that's the yeah, repeats are different. If you know what it's doing and then it does what you know it does, then that's, but if you don't know, and then you suddenly like, Oh, could be this. And then you test it and like, Oh yeah, I was right. I immediately think it's wrong. <laughs> well, and that's why we're scientists because you have to be critical and being yeah, critical exactly. is super important part of it. So one kind of out there question, what do you think of the censorship that's happening in the media now with science where platforms like YouTube and Facebook can tell people that have peer-reviewed studies that they're providing misinformation to the public? Oh, it's never happened to me. And I don't know anyone that this has happened to. Um, well, I'm saying in general uh, about the uh, P-A-N-D-M-I-C, which you can't say or you get... Uh, you get uh, Pandemic. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can't say that on like I've already had videos taken down. So oh, okay. Uh but there is clear censorship going on, I think now, at least in my opinion, there is. There's more than ever. And it's not just yeah, it's just it's a, like this topic is super difficult to deal with because like people have very, very strong views. There's a lot more to it than just science there's there's a lot of like there's a lot of political um and, and other very very nuanced things happening there so i think like it with that specific example it's it's really really difficult well, let me give you another example which is outside of our field but you know if you're a, a, an astrophysicist and you are looking at all of this new data coming out of the James Webb telescope. There are many things in there that would incline you to believe that the Big Bang didn't happen. And how, but you know that trying to publish those types of things within the dogmatic views that are is extremely difficult. Like, Censorship happens across social media. Censorship also happens in the peer review process. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yes. I'm very aware of that. Um, uh, uh, well, I mean, I know you can't say certain things, but maybe in a more general thing, you could, I mean, we can discuss how censorship makes its way into peer review. Well, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, this is a very complicated thing because what you want is you want people to review and understand your work and to review it, to check that a lot of people don't under peer reviewers do not understand their job. And the job of a peer reviewer is to check the statements and the data line up. Basically, you're not there to say like, oh, um, this should be rejected or accepted by the journal. That's not your job. Your job is to say, yes, the statements that are made in this paper and the data line up and I believe that the data is correct. I, or that I don't have any reason to suspect that the data is incorrect or falsified or anything like that. This is what you're doing. You're looking at that. The editor's job is to decide whether or not it gets accepted or rejected. But a lot of what you're doing is A, you're, you're going you're giving this work to people who are direct competitors of you because they have to understand the topic and the people who understand the topic are people who also study it. So basically you either have to be loved or, or not stepping on anyone's toes and phrase everything in the exact right way so that they won't reject your paper. And, and that's an incredibly difficult thing because it, do, it doesn't always happen. Like a lot of people think like, oh, I'm really great. I'm a great reviewer. But you look on, say, science Twitter and you'll see people saying really, really terrible things like, oh, they, this person's an idiot. Oh, I reviewed this terrible paper and blah, blah, blah. Knowing full well that person, that paper probably is on their Twitter seeing these awful messages that you're putting out to the world about how much of a superior thinker you are. Like it's just these 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 kind of behaviors are terrible, and I think you're giving yeah you're basically giving your work to somebody who is a competitor, and then they choose whether or not it gets accepted or not, and it it really largely comes down to in some cases unless the person is completely impartial whether or not they believe your ideas and to begin with without even looking at the data a lot of people are a lot more biased than they actually think that they are and they, this just i would that say they don't most know. people know they're pretty biased because a they lot have of scientists their... have a delusion that they think that they're not though they think that they're not they think that the evidence presented will sway them if it's strong enough but some people they're not movable key word key words strong enough yeah. you know and and this is and this is where I also have problems because strong enough is completely relative, and what's not strong enough to you may be more than strong enough to me. It's subjective. Yeah, exactly, it is. It's a very subjective thing. So I'm not sure. Like I wouldn't call it censorship, but I did like I, I have well, had but, papers that were where, where I did feel like I had unjust treatment. Uh, by the reviewers and that they had their own kind of agenda or idea of what they think. Like I had one that read half of one of my papers and was like, oh, I didn't like how they wrote the introduction and the discussion reject, didn't read the rest of it. Literally said that. And then the editor is like, yeah, they have so many papers. They're just looking for anything to weed them out. So they're like, oh yeah, they had one bad review reject. Like, and this is, this is the process. So, so it's, but do you self-censor? because you know the system do you oh, self-censor yeah. of course well then isn't so and self-censorship is the absolute worst kind of censorship you can present the data and not say something that you know will be inflammatory because even though you believe it and even though the reader could come to that conclusion themselves you could just choose not to say it because it will cause somebody to get their heckled up and then yeah so i think your discussion is not a discussion your discussion is a kowtow to yeah. the powers that be because you're supposed to be discussing the implications of your study this is the job of a discussion yeah but this is I, like I, I i it brings in a bigger question of what do we do to fix it because it's easy to criticize the system, but also coming up with a proper fix for it is very tricky. It's, it's actually, because a lot of people have, 
have ideas and like, oh, just make everything into bio art, but there are problems with that as well. And so like coming up with a, a good reasonable solution to this, this mainly it's a peer review issue. A peer review is new. A lot of people don't know that, but peer review is actually only, what is it, 60 years old or something like that, not even. Um, but to come up with another kind of good way of dealing with it is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly or not. difficult. Or not, because it's always been, and I'm, I've been saying this for 20 years, publish it all. Let me make my own decisions. I don't need. Yeah, I think it just, it's hard to read it all. And it's also another issue of, because you get, because uh, I agree with you in a lot of regards. I do I actually, and I think most people, most things should just be out there. But then another thing is, some people just put crazy out there and then because it's easy enough to read people start reiterating it and then and then you have like this thing where you know superconductors are making world news when in fact none of it is is actually like, but that but that stuff yeah. gets overturned instantly that's the thing yeah for it the really big does. ones but for the little ones it doesn't because nobody well, cares enough but guess what they probably never make it out of that person's basement like I, I yeah, just well, if you like... can just publish everything, then I don't know. I, 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 I can see you want... your point. I just don't entirely agree with it. I think we need. I don't know if it's like open review. Like if maybe it has to be like an endorsement thing, where we have like, you know, all the papers get published, and then the amount of scientists that read it and have like an ability to not. endorse then Love you, would, you would have like then you would know like oh I, we have 500 scientists from all of these places they put their name on it it's endorsed so then or they could have like comments like oh i like these experiments that one i think is dubious i don't endorse experiment in figure 4a wonderful but the rest of the paper is great like something like that i think would be a potential solution which they kind of do it's like review commons um in biology like they have some some things that do are kind of moving in that direction so there this isn't a novel idea but <laughs> um it's novel to me and i think that it's a great idea actually like i would love to see that i think that that's probably the direction we'll ultimately go um we just have to get scientists to get over there you know their love of the the glam journal and the peer review process and i think but i think it's changing you know like with the newer generations of people coming out i'm seeing a lot of the younger scientists um really kind of throwing off the shackles of thinking that they need one of these top end papers to succeed a lot of them are like you know you should just publish all your work and make it accessible to everyone and you know not even hide it behind walls and stuff like that and i was then the biggest progress. proponent of plus one ever i think yeah I yeah you know, and I still contend that, you know, some of the greatest work that of the last 20 years is published in PLOS One. Oh, some of the greatest work is published in a lot of places. Like, the, we have we have really great work that are not coming out from these high-end ones. Like, not all, like, in, you know, even the Nobel Prize winning, a lot of them, you always hear about them getting rejected from some of the top-end journals. And then, and then, but, oh, they still won a Nobel Prize. It's just, it's, kind of a, a fake thing that we made up that only these these this work is the only good work i think it's just not true this is a, a made up thing a lot of really great work is published in a lot of different places which is why they have this thing called dora which is accepted here but it's like a san francisco agreement where you're not really supposed to consider where it's published you, you're supposed to actually look at the quality of that person's work when you're assessing them for promotion and stuff like that and i think that the, these kinds of things are important steps in removing the power from these high-end, non-academic, like for-profit publishing groups that decide whether or not our careers are successful or not based on whether or not they chose to arbitrarily accept our paper this day because of three reviewers that accepted to review on that given day. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and all of whom <laughs> may have a dogmatic view of your work where you could have shown them that the Holy Spirit came out of this experiment and they'd still be like, nope, don't believe it. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. So even if you found the Holy Spirit, I don't believe in actually God exists. So then you're like, well, but I have, and they're like, yeah, just don't believe it. <laughs> and then what do you do? Like, you just, yeah, yeah, and you can't do it. anything. 
you can't do anything. This is just what you're dealing with. It would prevent stuff like that if we if we did move away from that. And I'm a big proponent of this. I think that the way in which we do things now isn't the best way. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, well, this is how I'm going to end it on a super positive note. What is your biggest wish for the world? If I was a genie and I could say, I can grant you any one wish, what would it be? Stop climate change. Stop climate change. That would be a nice one now, wouldn't it? Yeah, but that's my only wish. I, I just wish that we understood it. Because I think that we're still, like, we think we understand it and we don't really understand it at all. Like, I think that the... Uh, the correlation of CO2 to rising levels and the increases in methane and rising temperature, well, that's not by accident. This is happening. Uh, however, how to combat it and what ultimately has already, what shifts have already happened in the world that we're unaware of that will either ultimately lead to, you know, even higher temperatures or, you know, slap us back into an ice age somehow. I mean, there are multiple ways this could play out and we don't understand it. We keep saying, oh, well, we know if this happens that this will happen. Well, this is based on archeological and ice cores and data that there's, I don't care if you're going back to ice that's 80,000 years old. There's a lot of hand waving going on as to how the particulates and whatnot that are in that ice got there. And to draw these huge models and conclusions from that is really difficult. And I feel like we're all, you know, putting, sometimes putting the cart in front of the horse because we say we're doing these things and how are they trying to stop climate change? All the little people, all the average people, they're the ones that, <clears throat> they're the ones that need to stop using uh, gas-powered vehicles. And they're the ones that need to adopt solar. And they're the ones that need to, you know, do this with wind. Meanwhile, militaries can be the biggest polluters in the world, as the U.S. military is. And don't hear anybody talking about changing them over to solar. Uh you have all of these oligarchs and billionaires burning up the atmosphere with private jets and uh, cruise ships that are so big, they have to remove bridges so that they can enter the ocean. And uh, as people don't know, cruise ships burn the dirtiest kind of diesel that exists. It's the dirtiest oil, yet we have all of these cruise ships out there and yachts that are owned by uh, megalomaniac billionaires and nobody's talking about them not really it's the little person that's supposed to suck it up meanwhile the real changes that could be made are all in the things that the little people actually have nothing to do with in my yeah, we have no control of it no i agree with you i agree with you so i yeah more needs to be known but if i were going to get one wish just stop it now well, I think that's an awesome wish. And I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. I love your research. I loved our talk. Uh, I really hope you let me know when your uh, next study is coming out. I would love to talk to you okay. about, especially mm -hmm. on pesticides and pests and agriculture and crops. I, our discussion would go in a whole new direction that'd be equally fun. Yes, it will be. Oh, well, I definitely will get in contact. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I will talk to you again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye.